for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffman. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Ben Wright and Michael Vaughan with you again today, but no Phil Tufnell. The cat is, I'm afraid, unavoidably detained. So instead of spin, we've gone for some specialist fast bowling. The double Ashes winner, Steve Harmison, has very kindly agreed to step into the breach for today's podcast. He'll be joining Mike and me to chat about another great win for England at the Oval to clinch the series against South Africa, which was played out over the weekend in historic circumstances. We'll also be looking back on an incredible summer of cricket and the dawning of a new era under head coach Brendan McCullum and captain Ben Stokes. And we'll be casting our gaze forward to the T20 World Cup in Australia and the tour of Pakistan later in the winter. Hi Mike, how are you? Uh, No Phil today, do you think we'll cope? Uh, Where is he? Wow. A secret. It is a secret. I, 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 I kind of know, but I'm not allowed to say. But um, he's away. He's on an expedition. He's, he's disappeared on us again. Um, <laughs> but I hope he uh, he comes back and tells us uh, a few nice stories. If you know what I mean. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he has plenty of tales. Um, how's your nose, by the way? <laughs> yeah, a little bit sore. It's not very good for a podcast that you can't really see. But I, I got cracked on my nose playing golf at Royal County. <laughs> How did that happen? My friend Doug up one and he came with the wind and I just managed to see it and I managed to sway my head out of the way and smack me right on the end of the beak. Uh, oh, claret God. everywhere. I thought I'd gashed my nose open, went down on my haunches. A fella came up to me and said, and I just went, gash, stitches. He went, no, 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 no stitches. So I went, all right, let's play on. <laughs> I managed to par the hole and win it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That was a pretty good guy. How far away were you from him when he hit it? I'd say 30 yards. It, it was a proper snap book. Oh. Snap book, and then the wind brought it closer. Um, yeah, I was lucky, to be honest. It could have hit me on the side of the, uh, the Swede, and it could have been uh, a lot worse. So it just did. My nose is quite large, so it just might be at the <laughs> end of the beak. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's impressive that you managed to shake it off. Uh, we've got Steve Harmison coming on in a bit, uh, and we'll obviously be talking about the, the match at the Oval and, and the whole of the summer, because it's been... It's been a hell of a summer for English cricket. Before that, uh, I thought we'd just um, mention that it's Shane Warne's, it would have been Shane Warne's 52nd birthday today. And I know you knew him well. Uh, We haven't really talked on the pod about the huge void his death has left in the world of cricket. I kind of get the impression you would have enjoyed some of the cricket we've seen this summer. Oh, without any question, it's um, it's such a a shame that that Warne has not been around to see uh, he's good mate Rob Keane, the director of cricket. Um, Baz McCullum is a good friend of him. He loves Ben Stokes. Um, had him at Rajasthan Rose with him. And he's always yeah. been, for, for for all the time I've known Warney, um, crying on about how you should be playing more aggressively. You should be trying to whack it in test cricket. You should be going for wickets all the time in the field. You should be taking the opposition down with your aggressive mindset. Um, he'll be looking down on the England side and he'll be proud. As, as much as he's an Aussie, uh, I think he'll be looking down saying, you know what, that's the way to play cricket. Yeah, yeah. And it's been a hell of a turnaround. Coming into the summer, England had won one of their previous 17 tests. They've now won six of the last seven. But they haven't just triumphed. They've sort of done it with panache and a sense of fun. Well, they've done it by grabbing the nation. They've done it by playing in a way that you know, I, I've not been approached by anybody in the street to talk about the white ball team, all the hundred. But I've been approached by so many people that have talked about the test match team. You know, the style of cricket, the attacking nature, the fact that they just love, look like they're loving playing the game. Uh, I, I know that the old haunches in the side, Anderson and Broad, have almost been given a new leash of life. Now, yeah. Stuart brought it at the start of the summer, I think, was probably thinking it could be his last. But with the way that the team have played, the way that, you know, they've kind of embraced this this new style of cricket, um, they're really excited about going forward, playing in an Ashes series. And I, I didn't think they'd get to next year's Ashes because of uh, they've been in and around the side so long and the side weren't playing great. Um, but what Ben and Baz have done is, is just basically made Test Match Creek cool. 
you know, it's yeah, yeah, I love it. yeah, it's totally true, isn't it? I mean, coming into this this year, we were sort of talking about whether English cricket, you know, Red Bull cricket was uh, in danger of being used up by the white ball. But the longer form of the game has enjoyed this renaissance, actually the shorter format that feels a bit old hat. Well, you know what? I think what it's proven to me uh, is that we're a nation that loves test match cricket. Yeah. You know, the, the the men's team winning the World Cup in 19 was great and everyone got behind it. But I just think we are a, a nation that if, 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 you, if you're in your bed and your left side is white ball cricket and the right side is test cricket, I, I think most of us just fall on the right side. And we watch white ball cricket and we like white ball cricket because it is a good format and it brings great entertainment. But, you know, at the start of the summer, uh, Ben and Bass said they want to try and play a way that changes Test Match cricket. And they've been so yeah. true to their word. I, I, they're certainly not going to back down on it. They're not going to suddenly start playing smart cricket. They're going to be a good <laughs> time. Um, uh, and, you know, Joe Root's comment about, you no. Know, you know, the hundred, you can talk about that, but who wouldn't want to come and watch Ollie Pope try and reverse sweep a seam ball to try and win a test match? That's yeah. what it's about. Um, I, I think this test match team have done something that's not been done in the UK for many, many years where everyone's talking about test match cricket. So good on them. I hope it carries on. I hope they stick true to their word. I hope they don't suddenly start overcomplicating it in the winter. Just keep playing the same way. Yes, they'll lose the odd game. They might lose the odd series, but... Yeah. I think the bigger picture of what they're trying to achieve is which is to make sure Test cricket is talked about. It'll certainly get talked about even when they're losing. Yeah, I mean, you tell you, say that they tried to change Test cricket. They certainly did that. I mean, the, the idea of a draw, a Test match draw, seems to it needs to be put on the endangered species list, doesn't it? And then playing into the fifth day or even the fourth day feels like a hopeless anachronism. Well, you kind of half expect Stokes to throw his bat into the crowd and and shout, are you not entertained? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I think there'll be a, a few CEOs that would be a little bit concerned by this because you're not getting your four and days and five days. I, I, I know Sky Sports will be delighted with England winning and the brand and everyone talking about it, but when you pay so much money for five days and you're only getting two, um, but I don't think anyone can be concerned if England are playing this style and everyone's talking about it even if it lasts two and a half days it, it's not really that important it's about what they're trying to achieve which is getting test match cricket talked about and hopefully more people interested in the game because of the way that they're playing but ultimately it's about winning you know if they played this brand they'd only done three games and kind of lost three and drawn one um, you know they wouldn't be getting the praise it's the fact that they're winning they're playing a brand of cricket, which is fantastic to watch, and the winning games of cricket. That's the most important aspect. Great to have you on, Steve. Thank you for joining us and keeping uh, Phil's microphone warm for him. Um, obviously, we want to chat about the cricket at the Oval, but before we get on to the game itself, uh, it was obviously a historic and incredibly poignant day at the Oval on Saturday players and the officials and the crowd paid their respects to the late Queen and then I think I'm right in saying gave the first public rendition of the national anthem with the words God save the king for over 30 years so kind of an amazing moment sports administrators get a lot of stick a lot of the time but the decision to resume the test was clearly the right one don't you think yeah I think so I think on cricket terms yeah I think canceling it would have been a cancellation it wouldn't have been a postponement I Obviously, in my day job, I sat on Friday afternoon and I, there was football fans phoning in saying, why are we getting postponed? Why is it off? Why are we not going? And I flipped and flopped so many times and fell off the fence thinking, is it the right thing? Is it not the right thing? But in the reality, cricket would not be able to pay its respect internationally until June next year because that's the next international game that comes. I thought it was the right thing to do. and and do that and, and, and carry on. And then at 10.55, when when Laura belted out, God save the king, the realisation was this is the right thing to do. Um, I was standing at the far end, opposite end at the, at the Oval, where, where me and Voni had a good afternoon on Thursday in the green room. Um, we're all standing up. Um, the, the noise, the, 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 the thing that made the most noise was, do you know when people stand up and the thud off the seat just sort of belts that about just before the players came down the stairs, everybody stood up. Twenty five thousand people stood up, and the noise was that was noise was deafening. The thud was deafening, and nobody spoke for about two and a half minutes. Players come down the stairs. You normally get a clap and a cheer, 
Both teams, umpires, all came down. You knew something was special. I stand next to Goffey and um, Graham Swan. I've never, I've, I've never known Swanee be as quiet for so long. Two and a half minutes is a long time to be quiet in Graham Swan's world. Um, and when when she sang "God Save Save the King," and then the way the crowd went with it, I thought, yeah, this is that was the right thing to do. Whether football would have done that the same, I'm not so sure, but I thought cricket did it brilliantly. And Mike, were you there on Saturday or were you watching on telly? No, no, I wasn't. Uh, welcome to the pod, Steve. Thanks for um, nipping in for Phil. Phil's on an expedition. We can't quite <laughs> say where he is. We actually don't know where he is, but he's uh, he's away somewhere doing something. We're not too sure what. Um, All will be revealed in time. No, I actually was. Um, I was actually playing poorly in my golf medal, but we we stopped. Um, for, for a two minute silence um, but I, I just saw all the replays from the Oval um, after my round and the rendition of God Save the Queen, uh, King um, still hard for me to, to say <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to be queen. fumbling over that for some time yeah. to come aren't we I don't know how many people said Queen how many people do you think said around the world said Queen at the, t- the same time the first time she sang it I know it's right. it's it's a hard one to uh, uh, to kind of change too, but uh, I thought football should have carried on as well. I'll be honest. I know policing may have been an issue for uh, some of the bigger games around the capital, but uh, I thought the, the the weekend should have been about uh, the sporting games taking place, every fan in in every stadium uh, getting the opportunity to pay the respect with a rendition. Um, uh, I thought cricket did it brilliantly. Uh, the golf did it at Wentworth. Um, yeah, I, I, I get the policing, but if, the, if there would have been any, any way to try and get all those football matches on as well, to give the football fans that chance to to do exactly what we saw at the Oval, I, I know there'll be some some fans that necessarily wouldn't have treated that 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 anthem and and that moment with respect. But um, I, I thought football should have carried on. But uh, the England side did. Exactly what Ben Stokes said he was going to do. He said he was going to be entertaining. He said he was going to give the, the Queen an almighty send off with entertaining cricket. Um, I, I didn't think it was going to end quite as quick as it did. Um, in terms of overs, um, well, it certainly wasn't two uh, two days worth of overs in terms of Test match cricket. But um, this England side, uh, what I like about Ben and, and Steve knows him more than I do. He reminds me, um, when Tyson Fury is going into the ring, a heavyweight boxer, he, he outsights the opponent before he fights with, with sometimes nonsense, but he kind of outsights the opponent. And I reckon Stokes has got a bit in him. If you, if you listen to his press conference before the match, he generally says, we're coming at him, we're going to be aggressive and we're going to win. We're going to win as quick as we can. We're going to play aggressive cricket. Our batters are going to try and score quickly. Do you know what? When we get the ball in hand, we're going to try and get wickets. Um, and I think sometimes the opposition go, oh. <laughs> because I'll guarantee in every team, and I've played, you know, in many teams as Steve has, there'll be, if you've got 11 players and you as a captain says, right, we're going to play ultra aggressively, there'll probably still be two or three going, oh, I'm not too sure. <laughs> you know, it's my place in the side. I'm going to try and play a little bit defensively. But what Ben's managed to do, first and foremost, to convince Broad and Anderson to bowl fuller, bowl for wickets that every time they get the ball in hand, you only have to go back two or three years and they bowled safe and they bowled into length, bowl for dots, bowl for maidens. And what he's done to the batting unit is basically say, uh, try and think of every ball that you can hit a six first and foremost. If you can't hit a six, you hit a four. If you can't hit a four, you hit a three and then a two and then a one. And you start from there. It's uh, an amazing mentality that he's brought into the England side inside seven t- uh, test match. I don't know of any England captain in the history of test match cricket that's had such impact so quickly. Yeah, it was obviously a, uh, an important toss to win. 17 wickets on the first day, as you say, uh, and a, a test in which the bowlers dominated. Steve, how impressed were you with how England bowled? Yeah, they've been brilliant all summer, but would you sort of question them? It's Broad and Anderson. Like you never question McGrath and Warren. These two are in that... We've got to talk to them in that in that so We've got to talk to them in that bracket. Um, the, the 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 question your technique to go what what Michael was saying there. Um, Stokes got to be, Stokes got to Elgar before the series started. <laughs> he came in. Yeah. He, he came into the he came into the first press conference as he got off the plane, wanting to pick a fight with Stokes, and Stokes hasn't even said anything yet. So I, I, I struggled with Elgar this this summer. I, I really respect the guy. I thought he's a fantastic player, Test match cricketer. But I actually thought I actually think he felt the pressure before he even 
the test match started, test series started, and if he hadn't have won the toss at Lords, he would have gotten beat. Possibly he would have gotten beat three 0 I won't say he would have gotten beat three 0 But when you need to look at Broad Anderson. They've not done anything different to what they've done for for a number of years. They've combed in and around that off stump. Yes, the bowl that little bit fuller. The fielding positions have been a little bit more aggressive, as in the fourth slip stayed in, even at 70 for one. Um, and they basically said, and this is the this is the thing that's made them great in the last sort of five or six years. This is why Anderson has been better from 35, 35 to 40 than he was from 30 to 35. Is is basically as the game's changing. And batters are losing their shape and their techniques because they're wanting to hit the ball. Yeah. Well, the fundamental of bowling is still the same. If you bowl the total off stump more often than not, you will get wickets. You're questioning people's technique. That's what Jimmy's done. Jimmy's Jimmy's done. Jimmy's took the ball from if he's going to bowl in a way swinger, it's gone you know, middle, middle and middle and middle and off to go over the corner of off stump. If he's bowling in swinger, it's gone from fourth fifth stump to come onto off stump. Basically, he said, well. If your technique's not very good, I'll get you out. And Broad's done exactly the same. And we found Robinson, who possibly isn't at, now he's obviously got a lot fitter and a lot more professional. Time will tell if that can carry on. Hopefully it does. He is now probably the heir apparent to what Stuart gives you, because that little bit yeah. taller, it's that good length, um, for another four or five years, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, I must admit, Steve, I reckon. Um you talk about Jimmy, you know, say 25 to 30, you know, the game was played differently then. I think back then there was probably more players that were more geared to batting for a long period of time with technique to survive, you know, play for your off stump, leave the ball. I reckon Jimmy and Stuart in the last few years can't believe their luck. Oh. You know, they're bowling against some batters that all they think about is scoring. If they've got any lateral movement, they know hands are going towards the ball. You know what it's like, Steve, mm-hmm. as a bowler. If you've got any lateral movement and those hands are coming towards the ball, you'll be at the end of the up going, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Jimmy must wake up some test morning, see a few clouds, know he's got a duke ball and go, I'm bowling at players that are going to come at me. Yeah, come at me. me. No, one, no one tries to see him off. <laughs> They're coming at me averaging 25. <laughs> so on that point, how would Broad and Anderson, I mean, they, they'd enjoy bowling at England's top order, wouldn't they? Well, I think they would have had 1,400 wickets as opposed to 1,200 wickets if they're in the last couple of years. That's not that's a, that's a cheap shot at the, our top order. I just think it's the game in general. We 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 were in the, the green room the other night the other, the other day talking about that eras and times and you're mentioning five years ago, ten years ago, whatever. And somebody asked us about you know players you played against, and I'm going, I I, I played on this ground in 2008, brought back by Kevin Peterson. Graham Smith opened a baton, averaging 45. Ashley Mamla opened a baton at the dark, baton number two and number three, averaging over 45. Jack Callis averaged 50. Ibi de Villiers averaged 48, 49. I'm missing somebody out here, somebody, another good player, and I can't remember who it is. And I'm looking down, I'm going, you know, I brought Anderson, I'm doing anything different to what they were doing in 2008, 2009. And I'm going, you've got... Three, four players who are averaging twenty-five at, at best. And I didn't, yeah. You know, so I don't even acknowledge in their names, but you know, it's a different game, yeah. different way of playing. And Broad and Anderson never changed. They all have done is honed in on the top of our stump and said, right, if you want to play a big shot, yeah, you know, your technique better be good because if not, we'll get you out. The one, the one thing, Ben, though, that this England side would do, and, and you can question the top ball, there's still a, a few question marks about the, the opening pay, even though they've, you know, particularly Zach's had a, a good finish to the summer, there's still a few question marks. Mm. The one thing that they would try and do is try and hit Broad and Anderson off the length. Yeah. Whether it'd work <laughs> is a different question, mm. but what they would do, you know, look at Ollie Pope dancing down, trying to kind of get towards the ball, get outside the line of off stump, try and nullify LBW and Bold. Uh, you look to a few of those South African players who are averaging 25 because they're young, uh, just starting out in their test careers. But when the ball's seeming and they're staying right back into their crease, you know, I'm watching on the telly going, oh, it's only a matter of time. They're either going to drag one on or they're going to get on that scoot and they're going to LBW. You know, I think an England side playing the style that we've seen this summer would nullify those two dismissals. They try and say, OK, Let's try and nullify LBW and Bold. If we get out court, I think Baz McCullum will shake my hand when I walk in the dressing room. <laughs> I think I think if you walk into that dressing room 
and Baz McCunn sees that you've stayed in the crease and you played a defensive stroke for the ball moving around, you might as well come and join us in the green room, Steve, because yeah. I don't think you'll be welcome back in the dressing yeah, room. Yeah, well, there'll be, there'll be a, a welcome drink for them if they, uh, if they do, gonna, do want to come in there. And, but I like I look at this 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 unit. Yeah, you know, six from seven, they've done brilliantly. You know, I'm never ever going to take anywhere, anything away from winning test matches because it's brutal. It's hard to do. But this Baz Ball and all stuff like that, I don't like that terminology and I, I, I don't think the team do is either. But the bowling attack is anything but... the but if, you really, if you look at it and you try and break it down, the bowling attack is anything but Baz Ball. The fielding positions, Ben being Ben ultra positive. But there's no mystery to this bowling attack. The bowling attack bowls, six bowls at six bowls in and around off stump. Going on to or around off stump. You know, it's like it's like an opening bat. It's like an opening batter facing two hundred balls for a hundred, because he's basically saying, no matter how good you are, I've got an answer for you, and that's what this bowling attack does. It grinds you down. It basically says, no matter how good you think you are, the minute you try and do something different, lose your shape or your technique's not good enough, you'll come unstuck because we are so accurate, we are relentless, and we are working together. Uh, on that basis, would the old Trafford test be the one that's the the best basis for optimism there? Because it was obviously super dry. They were getting, they were reversing it. Stokes did that amazing fourteen over spell in which he he got rid of the old ball. Would that be the grounds for the most optimism ahead of the the, the series in Pakistan? Yeah, um, I think we we got a look at that's a whole different ball game in Pakistan. I I think we're going to have to look at the makeup of our side which is something Stuart probably won't go and I think that's the right thing even though I know he's going for um, he's not going to go probably for because obviously his wife, girlfriend, I, I don't know if Stuart's married but wife or girlfriend is going to give birth Wood comes into that like, perfect, I mean, that's what England need yeah. my worry is the second spinner my worry is the second spinner, how can you control the game um, from sort of two spin options. That'll challenge Ben, and I think he'll be up to that challenge. I've got no doubt the way his mind works. But his mind, it's all right saying his mind's going to work one way, but you've got to have the tools to deliver what you're trying to achieve. I think Ro um, Anderson and Robinson, I think, will be effective because they won't give anything away. They would your trump card, and then when it reverse swings, Ben's in the game. It's just whether what England see the best sort of second spin option or another, if they can get another quick bowler who can reverse swing the ball. Because when you watched it, you know, not long ago, you watched Australia and Pakistan. And Pat Cummins was bowling with a keeper nearly standing up. The ball is, the ball is, they're not doing anything. Yeah, you know, it's, it is literally, it was a, it was a, it was a pavement with a bit of a bit of bit of dust sprinkled over the top of it. So that is something that this this group needs. It needs this next yeah. challenge. I think that's the, something that you know this group probably needs right now, leading into into a, an ashes summer coming down the line. Is yeah. that they need to be tested um, in thinking outside the box and how they can get wickets away from home or on flat wickets? Because I can guarantee you one thing next year. Five five county five county chief executives and chairman will want flat pitches because they want the ashes going to the distance. They're not bothered about <laughs> they're not bothered about the oval doing it, zipping it around in three days. You know, two day test matches, three day test what matches. Steve, They'll be uh, uh, next year. Steve, uh, forget the CEOs. Ben Stokes doesn't play a brand of cricket that <laughs> CEOs are going to like. <laughs> <laughs> he plays the brand of cricket that the game gets done and dusted quickly. Some of those CEOs will be like, well, I hope Ben gets an injury, so he's not the skipper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve, I've told Mike this already, but I had day I had tickets to both of the fourth days at the, the two Lords tests. I got two hours of cricket. Yeah. <laughs> this, this this is what this team wants to do and the way they want to play. But mm -hmm. I think the pitchers and the opposition, I think the pitchers and the opposition have helped with the shortened games this year. Yeah. I don't think the standard of cricket has been the greatest. Um, I don't think England's batting has been the greatest with with taking Ben Stokes out of the equation at Old Trafford, which was an unbelievable innings. But I think there's question marks on the back end of the summer on, on some of our batting. But our, yeah. bowling, our bowling's been fantastic.
Yeah, so on to, on to the batting. We've obviously uh, mentioned Zach Crawley already, and we've talked about him a lot uh, over the course of the summer. He's obviously finally got a half century in the bag and a red inker to boot. Uh, I saw a stat from Matt Roller at Crack Info. Yeah, he tweeted this, and he said that over the English summer, Crawley got 276 runs at 23. All the other openers in the English summer, so that's Lees, the Kiwis, the Indians, the South Africans, combined, they got 915 runs at 23.46. So there are two conclusions you can draw from that. One, that it's really hard to open in England. Uh, and two, Crawley's performance was about on par. Yeah, I mean, let, let, let's get it pretty simple, Ben, though. Opening the bat is not easy. No, no matter where in the world. And it, it's not easy. It never has been. And you, you can't tell me that in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s that it's been easy. You know, the ball moves around. Averaging 23 is not going to keep you in the Test match team for a long, long time. It might give you a little bit of a period because they're winning. They've won yeah. six out of seven. But if you go and lose two Test matches on the trot and you're averaging 20 odd as an opening batter, I guarantee that you're going to come under pressure, more so than when you've won. Now, that's going to be the, the challenge for this opening partnership. You know, Alex Lees looks a player that's trying to play in a fashion that possibly isn't him. Mm. I think he's trying to play this aggressive style. I think he's probably the style of play that if he got in, he can play quite aggressive. But I see him more of a as a Yorkie style opening batter, a grinder, gives himself a better chance. But he seems to be playing so aggressive. Let's be honest, he could have been out any ball in that second inning. He should have been out for naught. And throughout the whole summer, you've kind of watched the opening pair and thought, yeah, I think Zach is certainly a player that he first and foremost plays better when he's thinking to score. I think he gets himself in better positions. But I've watched Alex Lee's closely now. I'm not convinced that he's a better player when he's looking to score from ball one. No. He looks the kind of player that needs to give himself a chance to get in, get his feet moving, get his balance, get used to the conditions, get used to the ball, what it's doing, and then he might be able to go up into the gears. Um, you know, you, you're looking at the opening partnership and, you know, it's been a problem area for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, Will they get a, a trip to Pakistan? I say Zach Crawl is definitely on the plane. I heard Ben Stokes' uh, press conference. He's certainly on the plane. I'd have doubts about Alex Lees. Uh, because of the way that he plays spin, I, I would bring in someone like Keaton Jennings, potentially. Really good player of spin. Yeah. Uh, when the ball's not zipping around, which he won't do in Pakistan, I think he might be better. He had a good 100 in Mumbai um, in Test Match Cricket Cup. So I could see Keaton Jennings coming in. I could see Moen Ali being that second spinner, ben, uh, Sahami. Um, you know, I'm putting him in that mid-range. You could even put Moen near the top of the order with the, the style of play that England are going for. So I think he'll be the second spinner uh, and then they'll pick Ben and, and two or three seamers to go with him. It just depends on, on the conditions. But I do see someone like, or maybe Hasib Hamid coming back into the side because he's a decent player of spin. So I think it'll be Hasib or Keaton Jennings who will open the batting in Pakistan with Zach Crawler. Okay. I think I think Keaton comes back into the group. I I think Lee's will go. Whether he plays, I don't know. I think Duckett will go. Somebody else, I think, left-hander plays, <laughs> sweeps very well. Um, fits what the way that this group want to play as he's a little bit more, he's more aggressive. I agree with Michael that I, I doesn't see him as though it is comfortable. Alex Lee's going at the ball. He's been dropped seven times this summer caught five times dropped seven times this summer um, and I think when in the winter in the West Indies when he was battling out battling out that was that was Alex Lee's at his best and when I look at you know Brendan McCullum said yesterday it's not it's it's it's, it's not easy batting opening the bat in England the last two successful opening batters we had in England both are sir they both got knighted <laughs> They both played the same way. And they both played the way that Lees wants to play in the first innings. And in the second innings, it seems as though he changes his game completely. And Zach's better when he's, you're right, when there's a target there. If, if Zach's got a target in front of him, it seems as though he's not worried about you get his players getting dropped. He's not worried about his back coming from sort of second slip. He's not worried about where his feet's going. He's looking to actually hit the ball because he knows it's like one day style. He's looking, he's got a, he, he's got the game in front of him. Um, I can see Jennings coming back in. I love Mo and Ali. I've known Mo and Ali. You know, I've got you know, my brother and Mo and Ali playing the same under 19 side. I struggle to think that it's the best thing for for everybody for the for the game that Mo and Ali comes back for for Pakistan. 
because you, as much as you're looking to try and win the next game, I think it's a sad case of affairs for spin bowling in this country if we've got to go back to Moen because Moen doesn't want to play test cricket. He's not interested in test cricket. Um, and I... Is he? Is it? I mean, is he not interested in Test cricket, or is it? Could he be interested in this brand of Test cricket? No, I think he's interested in going to Pakistan. I think if we're going to India, he's not going. If we're going to Sri Lanka, he's not going. I think it's. I think it's. 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 It's, a, it's an individual decision for Moen to go. And I, look, I'd love Moen Ali and my team. I think he gives you a huge amount of of options. Bat ball, um, his experience, um, his you know, <laughs> His personality on the game for the opposition, which I think there was a little fear factor with 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 the opposition bowling at Moen. Um, but I just don't I think it's a sad case of affairs if we've had to go back to Moen for our second spinner. But when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, Parkinson can't go to Pakistan against Pakistan on them pitches. Because we, we, we he would have played miles before he would have played a lot of cricket before now. And I don't see any other spinner. So when it comes to the options that are left as much as I really don't want to pick Moen, and it's nothing for anything other than he doesn't want to play test cricket and he's only going because he's sort of Pakistani heritage, that, but I'd still, you'd still have to pick him because if you're going down the mantra of I want to win the next game with my best team possible, you probably have to pick Moen as your second spinner. Uh, Steve, there's a new job coming up, the selector. Hmm. Um, if you were given that role, would you would you pick Mo? Would I pick Mo? Yeah, yeah, yeah I would. So you pick it. I think is him. there any chance? Is there any chance that you would be that selector, Steve? Um, I don't know. There's, uh, I've applied for it twice before, once before, and I was going to apply for it a second time, but I knew I knew the ECB had somebody else in mind. I think the way I've been throwing. Hand grenades at the ECB over the hundred over the course of the last twelve months. I'm not sure I'd be welcoming ECB town. Have you put your Have you put your application in? I have not applied for it yet, um, ah, but I'm thinking. Well, I'm think. I'm thinking hard. This is an exclusive, and Bulls might kill me for this because I've not said it on their channel. But I, it's something that intrigues me because Michael, I've my one of my best mates in the game is Rob Key. There'll be somebody out there that this job is more suited to and if if it is them they get the job and I know Keezy that 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 would be the case but I have a huge amount of respect for what Keezy's done and I'd feel as though if I've applied for it before I'd love to work with this group I'd love to work with Ben Stokes Josh Butler you know, Matthew Mark ben, Brendan McCollum because I think I think they are going places I think this cricket team is going places I think the they're trying to still save international test match cricket by playing the way they're playing. Joe said something brilliant today about the 100 and uh, Joe Root said something brilliant today about the 100 and, well, why wouldn't you want to come and watch Ollie Pope trying to reverse sweep a, a, a ball in test match cricket? Um, I, I, the, only, the only thing is, <laughs> and the thing that I remind Keezy about is he gave up a, a fantastic broadcasting career. Mine's, 10% of where his is, but I feel I can't throw stones at ECB without saying, well, hold on, I'll, I'm happy to come and try and help. And I'd love to try and shape the future of English cricket. So Whether it's, it's me or Steve, somebody Steve, else. On this yes. podcast, we, we like exclusive like this. It's great. Um, we, we like the headlines uh, that you're going to bring. Um, so you're willing to give up the correspondent role of Newcastle United for talk sport. I can keep that because I'm not talking about cricket. So, so you can actually be an England selector and still go to the Newcastle still go match. Go to the Newcastle the, games. Yeah. No, no, my God, I, I, I love, I love watching the game. I've been around junior cricket all the last sort of three, three or four summers. Uh, I like watching young players. Hopefully, get better, and think that's a it's a great job to to try and help and shape going forward if it was under the last re the last sort of regime I probably wouldn't apply because I don't think that way I'm not somebody who thinks you know me I wasn't I wasn't the brightest when it come to my bowling all I wanted to do was get the ball off my captain who was at mid on you and try and bowl as fast as I could I wasn't bothered where I was going at sixes or sevens or eights the only thing I was interested in 
was sometimes trying to hit the bloke on the other end, you know, in and around his helmet area. But I was, all, all I was interested in was getting somebody out. I was not interested in going at two and over third man finally. And that's and and that's what this group has. This is what and and that's what excites me about. Yeah, you know, possibly trying to get that job. But can I ask you, what, what, when you said earlier, oh, there'd be someone else better qualified. Who? Uh, seriously, <laughs> oh, no. what, what, what qualifications more will someone else have other than you? I don't know. I mean, I thought that last time, and somebody else got the job. Um, I honestly don't know. I, but I'd, I, <laughs> Steve, you, you talked about the previous regime. Obviously, the previous regime didn't didn't have a. There were the Chris Silverwood did the selecting. Um, there hasn't been a selector for a while now, and yet the team's doing pretty well. So why do you think it's important that there is a standalone selector? Why do I think? Um, yeah. I think you need an extra pair of eyes, but I think the ultimate the ultimate is with the, the captain and the coach. That would be me. I I wouldn't I think the the previous sort of selections that have selectors that have been down the road, I think some of it's been about the individual. Some of it's trying to reinvent a wheel. This wheel's rolling nicely. It's it's going nicely, this one. And it'll be a case of, well, what do you need next? Is this that this is what you're trying to play? There's four options. Yeah, so you you see the selector as kind of um someone to to help the coach and the and the captain. Well, it's a pair of eyes away from what they are seeing yeah. in my eyes. Um, and then you try and help them in a way that if there's a hole that needs filling. Or you have to, I think the selector needs to be there to think what potentially could happen in one, two, three years' time. I think they're the ones that think further down the line. Yeah. I don't think it's Ben and Brendan or Joss and, and Matthew Mott. I think it's about them staying in the moment and working with them on a on a plan which is further down the line and try and fill holes when it's like so a, a, an easy example you've got. You know, Broad and Anderson are going to be around for two years' time, in two years' time. So you've got to try and somehow make sure that the next... I remember watching Duncan, and you know, Michael, me and Duncan had a bit of a frosty relationship. But I remember watching the the the, the thing on, on Duncan over the course of the summer, and he talked about me and Simon in 2000. And he just said, I'm not bothered who you pick on that Lions trip or that National Academy, but Harmison and Jones have got to go up not bothered about anybody else, they've got to go. Because he's seen that, I think, probably along with Michael, that to win the Ashes in 2005, we need pace. So we need to find people who in the system that can can get us there. And I think that that for me is what a selector would be would 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 do. It wouldn't be a case of wholesale changes. We've won six test matches. Got the best one day side, one of the best one day sides in the in the world. You've got a you've got a one day side who are who are thirty something. So you you have to sort of plan a bit further down the road that this is the this is the message that's working. This is the game plan that's working. If somebody comes out, can we slot somebody in who is and try and steer steer in the background and not in the foreground? I think bef- yeah. I think in the past, I think we've had people that have got been in the foreground and it's been more about them than it has about you know, the other wheels keep on turning. Yeah. And you've got, you've got to remember a selector's job is not just to pick the, the, the main teams. You know, there's lines, um, yeah. that need picking. There's probably, um, some kind of input into the under 19s because you see players along the way as a selector. Um, the, the main side primarily, you would think that Baz and Ben now will know probably 17 to 20 players. It's always going to be amongst those at the minute. Yeah. Especially the with select- the consistency. That they yeah, have. and the selector's job is just to say, OK, spin, for instance. Spin is a big problem in English cricket. You've got Jack Leach, Moe Nally, Don Best, Matt Park. That's pretty much it at the minute. So somehow the selector has to get out there into the counties and start working with these county CEOs, um, directors of cricket, and try- trying to find a spinner or two that you can develop. A spinner's not. We, we we did the the stats on spinners in the UK about the amount of balls that yeah. they're bowling comparison to a Phil Tufnell and a Graham Swan after Giles back in the day. It's nowhere near. So a selector's role will be to work with all the pathway programs to make sure that we're getting some some overs into these young spinners. So by the time they're 24, 25, they have bowled twenty thousand deliveries, and if that means that 
as a selector or as a management group, you're saying to a group of young spinners, right, we've got to, we've got to take them under our wing and send them overseas, go send them to Sri Lanka, send them to India, send them to Austria, wherever it may be, to get those overs under their legs to make sure that they're, you know, they're, they're strong in terms of their action. They've got loads of balls under their belt. If they're not going to get it in the system that we have here in the UK because of the pitches, because of the way that we play our cricket, well, you have to find them them overs from somewhere. And that's the role of a select to try and identify those kind of players as well. And at the, and at the minute, and at the minute, when you look at it, England can, England can take 20 wickets to home. No problem. Done it six yeah. times. Yeah, we can do that. We know how to do that. Challenge for this team is, can you be the best team in the world, around the world? Well, you've got to find a spinner, which is a second spinner to pull it in when the next tour is. So the next tour is Pakistan, the next tour after that, the next tour after that, the next tour. When you when you, when you identify these, ta- when we're going to these places, we potentially have to have, we're probably not going to have Ron Anderson away from home. Yeah. Tried, that in, tried that in the Caribbean, didn't work. Didn't work. Um, but we're going to have to find a way of making sure England could time this perfect when a test match that Mark Wood could rock up to Pakistan, having not played all summer, with three three test matches like he did in Australia, and he could be our difference. Robinson Bowling, we are Anderson Bowling, Leach, Moen, Ben Stokes. The difference could be a fit Mark Wood. Whoosh, bang! There you go, ninety-five mile an hour. We did it. We got done by Akhtar in 05, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. 05. Mm-hmm. Bold rockets. Show it. Bold rockets. He bold mm-hmm. absolute rockets. Difference between the difference between the two sides. Mark Wood. I reckon Mark Wood army. I reckon he, he could save on tax. He could just live overseas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the point of living here? He ain't gonna play. <laughs> I mean, the, the the issue there is obviously injuries. I mean, it's, and it's not just him; it's Jofra Archer as well. So, Hami, what's your view on uh, pace bowlers and why they are getting so injured at the moment? I think I don't think the bowl half enough. I don't think Michael talk about spinners and you do the research on the spinners, but I don't think I don't think we bowl half half as much. We get picked early as well, though. That so that that's not the bowler's fault. You know, Matthew Parts got picked for England this summer. I mean, if you had asked him 12 months ago, he'd have been over the moon just to play for Durham all summer. And he's played <laughs> five test matches. played four or five test matches for England. And he's been brilliant. And he was uh, four test matches for England. And he was brilliant. Yeah, really good. You've seen signs. You've seen signs. And the reason why he was taken out was because there was a bit of sign of fatigue. There was a little bit of... And all it was was mental fatigue. That's all it was. And it was probably because he hasn't been under pressure for long enough in sort of match situation. Um, and I think some of our bowlers are like that. And I think I don't think our bowlers bowl half or not half as much as they, as they should do. I think obviously they get protected. Um, there's a lot of crossover cricket, which means probably the four day stuff. When you are when the dead games are coming, you don't play your key bowlers because you need them for the shorter format. Um, and that has a knock on effect and a detriment effect that when they do go and play the longer format of the game, they get injured because. <laughs> Bowling's not an exact science. Who on earth in the health and safety world decided that you were going to run as fast as you can for 50 metres, throw yourself up in the air and plunk yourself down as hard as you possibly can and then do it for 20 hours a day? Can we just go back to the main issue of the podcast, which is, are you going to be the next England slicer? Because I, I, I'm going to stick my hand up. I'm going to say, if you go for it, I'd like to know who's better qualified than you in terms of your knowledge, your passion, you love the game, you watch the game, you study it. I don't mind at all that your best pal is Rob Key. Doesn't worry me at all that you know Ben Stokes really well. I actually like the combination. So um have you filled in your forms? Do you need any help with your computer to send it? I probably do need I probably do need help with my forms. The, the, the funny thing about all these sort of podcasts and vodcasts and everything that goes, you see people's libraries and you see the, all the books behind. Mm. I couldn't do that with mine because I've just sort of finished colouring my first one in. So when it comes to, <laughs> well, I haven't got I, any. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to filling a form in, I, I still I'm still thinking about whether it's right. To, the, the problem I've got is if. If I go and fill a form in and put it there, then then there is going to be the question of the sort of closeness I have with, especially with Rob and especially with Ben. I've got no problem with that, and I don't think they have either. The thing with Ben is 
is is simple. I'd be there to help him in such a way that is support because he is he's got a great cricket mind. He's got a great cricket brain, um, and he, I think that role is there for yeah. It's a support for me. The selector has always been a supporting role because no captain should ever go on a field with somebody he doesn't want. And that, for me, would be the wrong thing from a selection point, a selector's point of view. If a selector's got an ego, he's the wrong man for the job. It's interesting that at the beginning of the summer, we were talking about the new McCullum and Stokes axis and whether they, the fact that they knew each other too well and that they were too similar and there wasn't enough yin and yang, well, that's all been proved wrong. So I don't think knowing knowing these guys and getting on well with them should uh, should detract from your... Uh, it sounds like Mike will uh, be a referee. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, we're, we're not we're not flavour of the month for ECB. That's the only thing. And my my <laughs> knocking of the hundred is um, my, I wouldn't say it would not go in my favour, but considering I've yeah, been but gone, you don't knock it. You just call it sixteen point four. I know, but that's where it is. It's a sixteen point four over competition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in unfortunately. And unfortunately, my mouth is sometimes three seconds quicker than my brain. And that takes some doing, I tell you, because there's not much going on upstairs. I, I think you should get that role, Steve. I, I just want to, I, I, I always, I love the England cricket team. I've never, do you know what? The, the biggest thing uh, I'll always say about me with cricket, you know, I got left out in New Zealand for Broad and Anderson in 2000 and whatever. I went away, got myself fit, come back, and eventually came back and played decided that enough was enough in 2009. And from the minute I finished playing cricket for England, I've been one of the biggest supporters. I've never been a, one of these players who has looked at the paper and seen another bowler when he had a struggle or England of getting beat has had a sort of a quiet cheer. I, I, I just want England to do well. And you know, and I'd love to be a part of doing, doing something like that. But I've also got a life that I'm trying to build as well. So I think... There'll be one or two other applicants thinking that way um, who will be at other jobs who will decide that is it the right thing for me to do? I mean, are the terms and conditions right? Everything that goes with it. Um, and then then I'll either fill it in or I'll I'll not fill it in. Steve, will you, will you get written in your contract that you have to be able to watch Newcastle live? Or... <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not so sure. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're only up, we're only up and up. We're going forward now. We're going forward, and that's been the brilliance about what, the job I've done. I've I work for an unbelievable organisation. I do. I, I really enjoy working for Talk Sport because I'm a sports person that can cover a lot of different sort of sports. Rabbit like you'd not believe, as you can hear. Um, and I've get I managed to sort of get myself in a role which. I've, I've done five games so far this season and it's been amazing. And would I want to give that up? That's something I've got to try and weigh in to the fact of that. Do I want to go for this job or not? Um, and there will be, there'll be some great applicants out there because, and it's, and it's up to Keezy to pick the right person who he thinks can work the blend with red ball, white ball, the people in between the sort of crossovers um, and he's also got to make sure that individual doesn't stand on anybody's toes because I think the most important thing for the test team right now is to is support. And part of his thinks he doesn't need to bring a selector in. But the other part of his thinks there is still further down the line, long term, that England needs to be looking at, which I think a selector could be invaluable to Ben and Brendan and Joss and Matthew Mott in planning on trying to make sure that everything they're doing right at this minute in time doesn't get disrupted by not having the next cab off the rank be the person that is replacing uh, uh, from a game plan point of view. Not been a great summer for the White Bulls side, but they've also had a change of leadership with Matthew Mott coming in as coach, Joss Butler taking over the captaincy from Owen Morgan. Uh, hasn't been quite as successful a regime change as for the test team. Why do you think that is, Steve? Um, because Owen Morgan is, was huge. Owen Morgan was, uh, that's a huge loss. Mentally, um, tactically, was a huge loss. And that's, that's something I think, I think England will be very good in Australia. I think they'll be very good in Pakistan, very good in Australia. 
and largely down to the fact that Josh Butler's not played any international cricket since the white balls stopped. He's had a chance probably to have a lot of conversations with Matthew Mott, sit down and get him game plan, get everything they're going with it. And I think you'll see a, a better side than we've seen this summer. I think that was a huge blow for England to lose um, Morgan. And I also, I didn't see it coming. I'm not sure they saw it coming. And I think because of that, England were a little bit rabbit in their headlights when they first started going. And I don't think yeah. they recovered. Now they've had a bit of time and space. I think you'll I think you'll see England revert back to type. Best yeah. team in the world in white ball cricket. And I think they stand a good chance. Um, last time we were talking, Mike, it, we the, just got the news that Bairstow had that freak golfing accident. Um, Alex Hales was in the in the frame, and he's obviously been picked now after several several years in the wilderness. Do you think he'll be easily assimilated as a squad? Oh, I think there's a bit of work to be done in the squad in terms of uh, the culture around the team. Uh, clearly, it's been an issue. Um, you know, I, I I don't know 100% what that issue is, but I'm pleased he's back. I'm always a believer that people deserve a second chance uh, and maybe it's the third chance for Alex Hales. Again, I'm not too sure what's going on behind the scenes, but, you know, England need their best players. You know, the one thing I'll say is England, you know, Ben Stokes has not played much white ball cricket. Uh, Jason Roy's completely lost his form. You, you throw into the mix, Owen Morgan's gone. Uh, Joss Butler's been in and out of the side. Um, you, you're missing some real quality in terms of players. And, you know, Alex Hales in, in T20 cricket is England is in England's best team, in my opinion. Um, so I'm pleased he's back. But I do think behind the scenes with the team, uh, they will need to do things to make sure that, you know, he comes back into, I think, what's the word? Re- reintegrating? <laughs> <laughs> that was done that a few times, did. Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's been in that 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 boat. KP was in it a few times. I, I think they might need a few re- reintegrated sessions to get Alex back in amongst the group. But uh, I'm pleased he's back. I, I really do believe that people deserve a second and third chance if, if that's what it's uh, if it is with Alex. Alex, let's just have a look at Ollie Robinson. Ollie Robinson, from a professionalism point of view, he didn't have a problem with the group yet, and it, it was it was something inside himself. And you look at the transformation, can he keep that going? I hope so, because there's no question the boy's talented. There was never ever any question of Alex Hills' talent. It was all about the inner Alex Hills that caused him the problems. Um, if he has a if he's had an issue with there was an issue there with Ben Stokes. Yeah, you know, good on Ben Stokes, the bigger man, the better man. The team needs to the team's the most important thing, you know, for saying because I, I I'd imagine there'd been a conversation between Rob Key and, and Ben Stokes about Alex Hills coming back. And um, I've got no doubt if he had said, nah, I'm, I can't play in that team if he comes back, then Alex Hills wouldn't have come back. And I think Owen Morgan had that himself. That was the problem he let Owen Morgan down. The problem he, Alex has got now is is not about cricket and ability. It's about his inner Alex Hills to either change or to conform with what the group needs him to, to do to make sure that the road is going forward and there's nobody pulling in a different direction or there's no individual in that. Um, hopefully, hopefully, if this is a, if it's a fright or whatever you can call it, that he's nearly lost his international career. He's now got it back. And he's got, he's, there's no question of talent. Or he's talented. It's the other stuff that he needs to make sure that he rebuilds trust in a group, which he potentially could go and win the World Cup for England because... If you bat one, two, or three in a 2020 side and you hit your straps, you could get a score that nobody else, you know, you could take the game away from them. And that's how good the boy is. Yeah. That would be a hell of a story, wouldn't it? Another prime docu- documentary in that. <laughs> Steve, uh, thank you so much. It's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks for taking your time. No worries at all. Right, I thought that was excellent. He's uh, he's obviously a guy who thinks a lot about the game. I think he'd be a brilliant selector, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd had a whisper that he, he might be in for it a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, I played with Steve and captain him for many, many years. And yes, he used to run in and bowl quick. Um, did I think at the time that he thought about bowling that much? Not really. He just pretty good <laughs> at it. Um, but over the years, and, and the more that you kind of are around people when they're not playing, you can see how much he really loves cricket. You know, he, he studies the game. He's always watching the game. He's watching everything on telly. He loves watching his young lad play junior cricket. 
Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty much the same. When you have a night off, you go down the local club and you watch the under 11s play. I just love watching cricket like Steve. And um, I think he'd be a really good appointment. You know, I, I don't worry at all that, you know, he's close with Robert Key. Uh, I have no concerns at all that he's close with Ben Stokes. Uh, as we've seen throughout the summer, the Ben and Baz combination, I questioned it at the start because I thought maybe they were a bit too similar. Um, well, it's been proven that it's a, a really good combination. Uh, and bringing Steve Armstrong, the good thing about Steve is he's got no ego. He'll stay in the background. He'll give them information. Uh, he'll offer them players. He won't say, you must pick that player. He'll offer them players and, and try and bring them uh, three or four different kind of options for them to decide. But um, I don't know who else is in for it, Ben, to be honest. I don't know the names, but um, I, I'd, yeah. be, uh, I'd be a little bit perturbed if someone like Steve Harmson went for it and didn't get it because I think he'd be the right type of person for this group of players and management. It's a bit, it's a bit weird that we're talking about him being too close to Keys and Stokes. I mean, what other walk of life would you, would the fact that you get on with your future colleagues be seen as a negative? Well, you, you know, you see in football, don't you? When a football manager moves, he takes his backroom team with him. Yeah. And, and, and the backroom team will have different personalities. And what I see in the management at the minute is, yes, they, they may be close and they, they might be friends, but you know, they're not the same. They're not the same people. Uh, they have the same vision for the game, which is for England to be successful um, and to play entertaining cricket. You know, that's what it's about for me. You know, back in the day when Steve was in the England side, he was a, a part of a group that tried to play entertaining cricket. So, you know, I, I have uh, no concern at all if uh, Steve Harmison is given that. I'd, I'd, I'd be amazed if he doesn't get it. If he goes for it, uh, I think he should be the next selector. One last thing I wanted to ask you before before you head off, uh, really moving rendition of God Save the King at the Oval. Um, as a England captain, as an Ashes winner, I assume you got uh, to meet the Queen a few times. Did uh, did you ever talk cricket with her? Um, well, I, I was the captain when she arrived at Lords, and I had to introduce her to the team. Um, so I wouldn't say I talked cricket, but I introduced her to all the players. <laughs> I had a private dining at Buckingham Palace one year. Oh. with Prince Philip and the Queen and that was a oh, wow. group I think there was 16 of us in a private room which was probably up there with the best days of my life and I, I know my wife will probably tell me off for saying that and my kids for when they were <laughs> born but to think that I went to Buckingham Palace for a three course dinner and a nice glass of wine or two with particular Prince Philip I was sat next to him uh, and he oh, yeah. was in the room. Um, that was very, very special. She was a, a very, very special person. And, and the, the outpouring of emotion over the last uh, few days all over the world. I, I don't know of anybody ever will ever get this kind of outpouring of emotion. And, um, you know, we as a family, we're going to nip down to London for the, the funeral, not obviously invited, but I just think it's it's something that we want to be down in the, the capital for just to be a part of it and, you know, I guess we'll all be saying our goodbyes next Monday and uh, we feel as a, a Northern family, uh, no better way to, to say goodbye than to be in, in the capital on that day. Right, that's it for today and indeed the season at the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club. Massive thanks to Steve Harmison for joining us today and huge thanks to everyone who downloaded and listened to the podcast over the last 16 weeks. The time has really flown by. Mike, Phil and I have loved it. It's been an utter joy to have been chatting about cricket each week during what has been an incredible period for the sport. We've very much enjoyed reading all your emails. Please do keep in touch throughout the autumn. The address is cricketclub at telegraph.co.uk. Let us know what you liked or didn't like about the podcast. All feedback is greatly appreciated. We'll be back in the winter when England tours Pakistan. In the meantime, the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club channel is stuffed full of interviews with star-studded names like Joe Root, Trent Bolt and Wazim Akram. One thought to leave you with, England won six tests this summer. The last time they did that was in 2004. And I think we can all remember what happened the following season. Thank you once again for listening this week and for all your support over the summer. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.